the second and final workshop. Well, maybe not final, because we're always working on complete streets. But tonight we'll um, incorporate your input from the last meeting um, and show you strategies and suggestions to make our streets even more safe. So um, before we begin, I'd like to recognize um, some special guests. Let's see. Chair of the McCulley Neighborhood Board, Ron Lockwood, is here. Um, I um, and of course, we have um, Chad Taniguchi. Hello. All right. Yeah. The boy, Mike, and, um, and from the Department of Transportation Services, we have Mark Garrity, the Deputy Director. Stairs, our city bicycle coordinator, and also Mark Kikuchi, Craig Trump, Jack Patterson, and Aaron Rejoblin. Okay, thanks for being here, you guys. So, and also with us tonight is my colleague and chair of the Transportation Committee, Councilmember Green Harimoto. And we will be introducing Dr. Burton. Thank you. Okay, it's great to see all of you here. Thanks for joining us. I know I see some familiar faces from last week and some new faces, so that's great. Uh, we are really pleased to have with us a national expert. If you were here last week, I think you'll agree that he is a really, in addition to being an expert, just a really inspirational person. You know, I always say that here in Hawaii, especially, we just kind of tend to have these blinders on and just do the same thing over and over. And I think, uh, if you were here last week, I think you'll agree that with um, our mainland expert here, he just inspires us to think outside of the box and just think about what could be. So I think that's his real strength. Um, tonight we are really honored that once again to introduce um, Dan Burton and Samantha Thomas from the, let see if I got this straight, Walkable and Livable Communities Institute. I always have trouble with that. So they are the experts. This is what they do for a living. So please help me welcome Dan Burton. Thanks, Breen. And let's give Breen a special thank you. Tonight is his birthday. Oh. Uh, 34. Is that right, Breen? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Services. They have taken part in so many meetings in these last two years. And, uh, and really celebrate where we are. This is one of three demonstration project sites. Your neighborhood is uh, one that was very carefully chosen uh, by your council members. Uh, in order to have successes right up front in launching complete streets for all of Honolulu, and I want to say that what we're able to do here tonight and the whole platform of the change that we see is truly going to inspire all the neighborhoods in the community. So this is really important. Uh, I want to start by asking how many folks uh, are here for the first time tonight? That is, you weren't here last week. Can you raise your hands? Great. So uh, those who didn't raise their hands were here last week and they're they are full of great ideas, and I'm sure your ideas are going to add to them. But what I'd like to do uh, is just do like a two-step process tonight. It's fairly simple. Uh, the first is to present what we heard from you last week, uh, how those concepts or ideas work, <coughs> demonstrate some ways that the tools work, and really launch on the demonstration project itself. That what the city council has been able to provide are demonstration monies, they could be spent um, near term, but then think big and think long term. So I'm going to share with you those uh, items that are first and, and uh, easy to implement, 
and then show how we can grow from there. Once we finish the presentation, uh, it's uh, a good time then for questions and answers. And then new ideas, ideas that maybe we haven't recorded yet so that we can make sure that we don't overlook the importance of an intersection, a street, a, a way to be able to move about a lot better. Does that sound like a good deal? Sure. Okay, let's do it. And I'm going to start, and for some of you, there will be a little bit of a repeat or a refresher. This gentleman standing here assumes that the world should be pretty much as he sees it. That uh, families should be able to come together in public ways. And, uh, streets should be healthy, packed with people. And if that's what it should be when we complete the street and have healthy places, the sad and unfortunate condition is that we have too often turned our cities over to cars. Uh, Honolulu ranks number two in the nation for uh, traffic congestion. Uh, you were number one, but you're getting better. You're getting a lot better, uh, but it's marginal. Um, and now what we want to do is truly allow people to have choices not to drive everywhere, uh, and certainly in their own neighborhoods, to be able to walk, bike, use transit more successfully. And what that means is a different way of looking at our streets. Our streets are there obviously to move traffic, but they're there to create place. And that's going to be my focal point as we go forward. And so it's also important to understand that when we complete a street, we're completing it for all people, all abilities, all ages, all incomes. And, and truly, once we finally can say that uh, any person of any ability can live in our neighborhoods, all diversity, that's what most neighborhoods really want to become over time. So completing our streets also has to make money. And this is a very serious item for your city council. Uh, if, if we can say, well look, it's going to cost some money to transform that street into something like this. Yes, but it is going to add so much value to the land and the place that you wouldn't do anything less. That you want to always spend transportation dollars that add value to a neighborhood. And, uh, and it doesn't matter the size or the scale of the street, completing the streets is truly uh, setting the stage for the next economy. It's setting the stage for a greater prosperity in every aspect in terms of quality of life, social health of the street, and so on. So we'll still have this. This will always be there. Uh, we made a massive investment in our highway infrastructure system, but it's chock full of traffic, and there is no other solution other than to not have to have everybody drive as much. And so when we look at the options for the future, we could follow one of two courses. We could keep building and adding to the infrastructure uh, that we already have, but we've reached a point where that is so prohibitively expensive that's probably the, the least sensible thing to do. The other option is to plan our neighborhoods for people and place, and with that we get people and better place. Uh, so we're starting uh, with your neighborhood, the uh, Moalili, uh, the Koli area, as you can see here, the greater area. And we're going to zoom in on some of these areas. But one of the things that is so important, first of all, you have one of the highest and best concentrations of elders of anywhere in all of North America. And it's become the most dangerous place in all of North America to be an elder. So we know that we want to make sure we make it easy for people to get across the street, for people to go to their principal addresses, to enjoy social engagement, the social lives that uh, come with that. So I'm going to start with just a couple of what I call a photo morph. This is a project we are working on in uh, New Orleans. And the question is, can this place uh, that has buildings already, even has a terminating vista, be made into somewhere that everybody wants to come to. And they want to respect the place, drive through it at the right speed. And so working with New Orleans, uh, this is what they want, and this is basically the concept of what we're talking about. Uh, we heard from you last week that you want your streets to be greener, uh, to be more colorful, 
and uh, to have lower speeds, but, but move traffic, provide the parking people need, and allow the businesses to grow. This is a fairly simple concept from uh, spaces into places. So if I were to sum up the whole presentation, this is an overview of what we're talking about. Now, when we talk, though, about completing streets, we're talking about a shift in our culture, our way of thinking about streets, that streets are no longer just for one thing, they're for many things. So I want to introduce the process we went through last week, and in doing so, celebrate uh, those of you who came, who shared your ideas, and uh, uh, started with a walking audit, which is kind of fun. We did that in the rain, and uh, uh, enjoyed and appreciated the fact that then, when we started the workshop, uh, record numbers, really good attendance, and a lot of good ideas started to flow out of uh, many great minds, people who cared and shared and uh, gave us a, a, a foundation on which to grow ideas. We asked you to declare what you value the most, what you care about, and I'm going to show you the priorities. If I were to come back two years from now and we had a totally different audience, the values would be almost identical. Uh, that's what we found as we go across America. So what you care about here, uh, certainly your special place, nature, the family, friends, community, uh, the location, the proximity and the convenience, you get that, you understand that you want your stores and your parks and your uh, open spaces all to work together along with your homes. Uh, people care about active transportation. How many of you walked here tonight? Sort of? Okay, how many use transit? How many bicycle? Huge number. And how many did not drive alone? And all those together, all hands up that did not drive alone. Okay, that's, that's a very good start. By the way, I've been to cities in America with 60, 100 people. Not one hand could say they biked or walked or used transit. They all drove alone to get to the meeting. So you got one up on a lot of places in America. But I think as we got into the presentations and then the discussions, uh, setting some priorities, brainstorming, a lot of ideas began to flow and a lot of friendships. Alan then went and uh, started working on drawings, uh, uh, did some good summarizing of conditions and so on. Uh, we had two other graphic artists from two other parts of the country. All capture your ideas, which you're going to see in a minute and put them into something that is easy to grasp and understand. But I, I want to further get us into what the Complete Streets concepts are all about. It's, it's truly about creating conditions where walking, bicycling, transit are as natural as any other way of getting around. That you can switch out a mode in the middle of the trip if you chose to and feel comfortable doing so. You know you can get across the street. You don't have to go back to your car, get in your car, and drive across the campus. <laughs> you can walk across it. Um, and it's, it's important to understand that uh, the language that was written into your Complete Streets Bill uh, that uh, it was passed by your city council is very basic and it's very simple and it's very achievable. It, it's not pie in the sky. It's just why aren't we doing these things and now let's figure out where we can build the model projects that allow us to do things like incorporating trees, landscaping green, be more sustainable, have cooler streets, um, and add the value back to neighborhoods that left out some things that were pretty important in the start. Now I also want to emphasize that when we complete a street, it's for everyone. The fire service, people hauling freight, people delivering uh, packages, every user of a street is not to be left out. Every user is included. Um, and we just have to accept that, but also uh, throughout your history, Honolulu has always found ways to accommodate big oversized vehicles without having to build big oversized roads. You've just done it. And you have that expertise. Uh, when we talk about what's the right width for a travel lane, where a lot of cities say we're not going to do anything less than 12 feet, and we're not going to adapt. You've already done that. You've got many streets that are down to nine foot lanes, 10 foot, 11 foot's very ordinary. And it's actually the wider lanes that are less ordinary in Honolulu. 
Uh, but you have to accommodate turning ra radii and uh, oversweep, we call it, uh, on like curb extensions or uh, making sure we plant trees that aren't going to dominate. And again, you've got the history. You've been building streets that have been uh, calming the speed of traffic, making them safe for our children to get to school, including right out in front of the church here. Uh, the first roundabout in the entire state of Hawaii, right here. And done well. Uh, moves traffic well, it, it's quieter, it's much safer. But throughout the island, we're seeing uh, cousins and uh, relatives of the original roundabout making it easier for our children to get out where they can be seen, where, where they can see the traffic, the traffic can see them with very thoughtful geometry and so on. And again, this is not a new concept. It's just a new wave of thinking, new administration, a new way to go forward. We also want to celebrate the uh, Hawaii Department of Health, who is funding this entire series with us. Uh, they get it. They understand that if we don't have a place where you can naturally walk and bike and do the things, we will continue to lose our health. And that will be so costly that we have to now find a way to have a built habitat that works for all people. So they're a great partner. In fact, you've got many partners, including AARP, uh, obviously the Hawaii Bicycle League, uh, many people who've been taking these walks with us and see and understand what uh, you're wanting to achieve, including walks that started over a year ago. And uh, have then helped create uh, the documents that you can now download uh, from our website. We'll give you the address in a, in a moment. But uh, this is all observations and text showing uh, the challenges, <laughs> pretty extreme challenges in cases, and how we're going to overcome uh, the lack of some tools that uh, should have been there in the past, but today, something as simple as a curb extension would let Heidi get across that street safely, right? But because there's no curb extension there, people park there, create a screen, which creates the hazard, uh, or uh, what I consider the smallest pork chop ever built uh, on university, right? And King of Baratania, is this, this is where they all converge, right? Uh, now, I've been studying this intersection for over 20 years. I don't have the solution. There's got to be something much better than it's out there now, but, but that intersection is being asked to perform a lot of duties all at the same time and in a great, crazy mix. So now let's take the values of the neighborhood. And this was among your highest value to honor your heritage, your culture, your, your children, to give a uh, your families, places to grow healthy, to to grow smart, to uh, attend good schools, and uh, be able to go places, to do things, and and uh, and at all ages, and truly to celebrate all ways of getting around. Now, any particular group, whether we're talking about pedestrians or transit riders, bicycles, whatever, come in different colors and shapes and so on. These are the skilled cyclists. They know how to ride. They know how to be good mentors to others. There are others who are pretty new or green, but they are really striving to become very good bicyclists and have the freedoms and so on. Same with pedestrians. And again, all sizes and scales and diversity and age. Uh, wonderful places to walk to. And uh, we've probably eaten six or eight or 10 meals <laughs> at the uh, Down to Earth. Uh, but keeping in mind that all abilities are celebrated as we complete the streets. So let's now move into some of the uh, further things that we were able to do during the meeting. Uh, after we got a, a very fine list uh, going of those things you cared about, uh, we then were able to put them together in a coherent form and uh, ask you to vote on them, not to be scientific, but to give you ideas of which things you cared about the most. Some of these are only long-term. You cannot do these next week, next month, next year. But some of them you can go out and do almost immediately. So number one on your list, uh, and this actually came as a surprise to some of us, is to complete the connection between the university and YKT. Uh, to get a pedestrian bicycle only bridge that would span the canal and make all the rest of the travel achievable 
and something that you can plan for and over time. So that was number one on your list. Obviously, education, implementing the BYK project, very important. There we go. Uh, creating more green space. Oh, now, you're going to see a lot of these things just start to appear in many of the treatments. And uh, so we'll go forward, And uh, but number one issue I want to start with first is to complete the bridge. So I'm going to give you just ideas, uh, starting places with bridges that are designed for people first and uh, do not include vehicles, uh, that is motorized vehicles. This is a pretty famous bridge now designed by uh, the famous Spanish architect whose name I'm going to forget uh, in Redding, California. People will drive two hours out of the way when they realize they're that close to Redding to, to walk across this bridge. That's how important that bridge has become. I think you're going to find when you build something and it's iconic, people are going to plan vacation just because they want to see great architecture. And uh, this is certainly in that category. Uh, again, imagine people rerouting themselves, drive two hours out of the way in order to be able to walk across this particular bridge. In Winnipeg, another iconic bridge, uh, and again, pedestrians only, uh, bicycles too, and they put a restaurant in the middle of theirs. And uh, they wanted a destination on the bridge and eyes on the bridge, the added security, and so on. Uh, even places like Wichita, Wichita, Kansas, found ways to create the spires and the attraction so that this can be used as a navigation aid uh, thousands and thousands of feet. People know where to go to get to uh, the Grand Bridge that, that connects important parts of their city. We also were able to come up with a, a list, and I'm just going to refer to them as hot spots. They're based uh, on a number of issues, but one of the key issues is safety. That we are going to really need to focus on safety first, and then add to that in order to, to achieve uh, all the uh, opportunities of, of growth and so on. So let's start with a Baratania Street at uh, Eisenberg. This was uh, identified as the number one. A demonstration site where we have sufficient funds to, to launch the project and I'll just uh, basically say right now there's more paving than you need by many factors and uh, so we can take some if not uh, a, a lot of the paving away you can see it's exaggerated on all the corners and uh, uh, and it's just so it's a huge amount that uh, that could be now transformed and basically all four corners. And so this seems to be a really good start point for how do we now reclaim territory and really come up with something that's meaningful. So we, we start with the plan view, we call it. So you can see how much green area can be transformed. And in fact, if we look at this closely, it can be much larger than this that could become green and not impact motors in any negative way. Great, good. Uh, pockets. I'm going to refer to that concept as placemaking. It's one of the hottest new things in America. This is, uh, can everyone agree, uh, probably not the best place to go and spend time. And forget where it is. Uh, but it's, it's stark. I'm going to show you this transformed. Now it's going to be in another city, but can you see where the old curb line was? And all they did is created this parkette, or, or uh, really a good corner where they can anchor a real social life. Uh, this uh, helped create new stores that were uh, uh, suffering before. Now they're, they're pulsing with human activity. From about 6 in the morning to 11 at night, this place is packed with uh, uses of people. We're doing the same thing in Manhattan. Oh, by the way, let me go back one. Because of the success of converting this one corner, within walking distance of this location, every home went up in value significantly. People want destinations. And they want places that they can uh, be attracted to and find attractive when they get there. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This one's in New Orleans. Um, probably illegal. <laughs> but they probably have a fireman sitting with them who's laughing as hard as they're laughing. Uh, this is New Orleans. Um, you can see uh, um, Broadway in Manhattan all converted. All these places are becoming packed with people and stories 
This used to be a five lane road. Uh, still manages the traffic very well and uh, now created massive amounts of green and, and buffer to the street so that these shops are now thriving. So let's start small. We could just use paint, but we can also bolt in rubberized curbs. Very easy to do. Later, if you want to use them somewhere else, you unbolt them and move them to the next place. And then the potted plants. That defines this is now for people. It's not to drive in or around. You can then, perhaps over time, even start a small industry of people who make all kinds of pots and so on that are meant to be for streets and uh, green and uh, so on. And again, we see this emerging throughout all of North America, different climates, different plants, but all uh, defining some vertical height so that it no longer looks like a place you should drive. Uh, and again, a beautiful way to start to reclaim streets and add the color of the vertical height, the vertical walls, and um, really define good places. This happens to be in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, they're greatly transforming their principal streets. And, and again, the pots, in this case, someday perhaps will go away. They'll have real curb extensions here. But right now they're so attractive and so beautiful, they'll probably keep them for, for a good while, helping to find important corners, crossing points, and uh, enlivening <coughs> their entire city. Now eventually, uh, with another round of money, you would then be able to build real curb extensions. And curb extensions can, can create a formal dining space and other uses that are very green. And notice here all they did was use the, I think these are called French gates or something like that. Uh, they're pretty successful. And uh, uh, notice how simple it is. Uh, by the way, in their case, they, they just go out and do that over a, a Friday, Saturday evening. And they have permits to do that, and it works very well. I toss this in here just to show another way to move vehicular traffic out away from the edge when you don't need it. All of these cars are just parked here. This is a buffered bike lane, or uh, we'll use some other terms here as we get into them. But I wanted to give you a good introduction, and then take a section of Baratania. This is my attempt at doing a photo more, and show you that just using paint and color you define a better use of the space. And this can be done up and down uh, ma major sections of Baratania, Kang, uh, and some other streets. So the next tool I want to introduce, and there are multiple places where we can use these in your neighborhood, is referred to as the buffered bike lane. It's a buffer. And in this case, uh, you take a full lane out, you create the buffered area, and uh, so the motors has their dedicated space, and then the cyclists their dedicated space, and then a, a buffer between. This used to be a four-lane street. They took it down to two lanes after they did the traffic counts. They said, if you got one lane too much, motors will have better sight lines, they'll be able to turn better. Uh, all the things that we want to occur in neighborhood occur once we add in uh, a buffer bike lane, get the speeds down, because now only the prudent driver can set the speed. All these were done in Venice, Florida, uh, a recent project that we studied there. And again, you can see how it adds greatly to the creation of the street. Tree wells. Uh, you'll notice in my illustration, I put in a couple tree wells just to help further buffer or separate the motors out. And again, notice how it can improve sight lines. If you want to get in out of that little driveway, for example, you can pull further forward. It also adds color and, and uh, vertical height to a street and uh, so on. Now we go to Baratania and uh, uh, Macaulay. Uh, 14 vehicle to vehicle accidents uh, based on uh, data that was provided to us from 2007 to 9. And I think you can see some of the challenges uh, with wide open intersections like this. Uh, and again, we're going to look at uh, a whole series here of Punahou, Street at King, right? another challenging intersection. And a lot of space that can be reclaimed. I'll show this uh, in a moment. Uh, notice again, um, uh, areas that just uh, were, were overly zealous in terms of what, what they needed. For example, look at all of the radius on this corner, this street. And the motors can't even go this way. That's illegal. 
and it would be really stupid to go that way. But the radius says, go ahead and do it anyway, right? So what we do is we take away all that space that's sending the wrong message and is not helping us with the life of the, of the buildings on the street. King at, I uh, hope I pronounce this right, Holy? Yeah, you got it pretty close, okay. Uh, pedestrian related crashes here are pretty high. And so this has become uh, one of the model new areas for, for putting in street crossings. Uh, we crossed a number of times, a number of ways. Uh, with the setback of the stop line, look how far back the uh, stop line is. Uh, this works pretty well. There are a few little problems, like you can't see the uh, sign of where you're supposed to stop. That's just a matter of moving where the sign is. But, but overall, I want to get across the concept of how we get people across the street. So I'm going to take you to a, a real street, and I'm going to drop the Beatles in. And if the Beatles were to make it out of that street, with 77 feet, walking at a normal speed, it would take them 22 seconds to get out of the street on the other side. Now, here's the interesting thing. A car going 30 miles an hour is moving 44 feet every second. The Beatles wouldn't even see the car that's going to take their life. It's already around that corner. And uh, so, what could we do to make sure we always get to hear the Beatles music? What can we do for the Beatles? Yeah, we could, we could uh, certainly narrow the width of their crossing. There are two ways to do it. The first way is, is just involving paint, and it's a pretty simple thing to do. So we put in the bike lanes, and now they don't start from the very edge. And by the way, then we put in a median. And there are a lot of intersections where we can do that. That's easy. Um, we might have to require the motors to go down another block sometimes. Uh, but now the, be uh, the Beatles only uh, are exposed for six seconds. And that's pretty good. And they can see traffic from six seconds away. Uh, but we could go another step, and I picked this road on purpose. This road's carrying 20,000 cars a day. Now that is a lot of traffic. But if we put in the right tools, we could actually manage the traffic as well, if not better, and get it down to two lanes. Now we're going to be real careful not to suggest taking out lanes when you don't have the ability to do that. But many of your streets have the ability to lose a lane. And that's where a lot of our discussions are going to start. And now getting across uh, from a safe zone to a safe zone is incredibly easy. Uh, only takes about three seconds. Now the tools that we put in can be done on either a two-way street or even a one-way street. You've already proven it on some of the streets over uh, on final approach to Waikiki, where you've got a one-way street and you've got lanes going on both sides of an island. Does everybody know the street I'm talking about? Alan, you, you probably know the name of the street. Yeah, it is. So when we do a crossing, we like to get the curb extension in when we can. That puts the pedestrian out beyond the sight line of the parked car. And then a fairly narrow crossing. And then we point the pedestrian to where they're forced to look at the traffic and then complete the crossing. That's a fairly simple process. And uh, we're just going to show you a number of the tools that we use. Uh, we also can put in uh, special signals. We do what's called a half signal a uh, hybrid beacon. These are all very successful. And here's how they work. Uh, the hybrid beacon is, is inactive until somebody activates it, a pedestrian. And then it goes to a flashing yellow, just like it would at a regular signal when it's time to change. And then it goes to the steady yellow. That means you shouldn't be going through. Then the steady red then what we call the wigwag, when the pedestrian's already halfway across the street, your lanes are now free, you could go if there's no one there, and then finally it returns uh, to being blank for the driver. So that's a new tool, but it's one that can work real well. So I'm going to show you one that we're installing in uh, Albany, California, and I think you can see how much easier it's going to be to get across the street. Now in the right lane here, because this road has to carry a huge amount of traffic, we're also putting in what we call a green shadow lane. The bicyclist is there, you don't pass. You go in the other lane, it's there for that purpose. And uh, so just to show you how we can make these transitions over time.
So Macaulay Street is this challenge between King and Kapiolani, right? And uh, uh, it's in the bike plan, the Oahu bike plan. Uh, again, very challenging sections and very difficult to get across the street with the speeds and, and the uh, brakes that we get in traffic. I want to now get into more detail on the cycle track. That's something that's being looked at quite seriously um, by the DTS. It also is being looked at very seriously by your mayor. Uh, Kirk has uh, talked with me directly. So this is an example. We did this for King. You can see uh, this early model, and then I'm going to transition to one that we modified slightly. Going to green for the cycle track. Notice the cycle track is at sidewalk grade. We have a two-foot buffer up here and a two-foot buffer here. You can put in the tree wells we mentioned. And uh, to do all of this, you only have to eliminate one travel lane, which you seem to have in excess numbers in a number of sections uh, on King for sure. And uh, other roads, we were looking at Pensacola as a possibility for a first treatment. Uh, Typically, you like to do these where you don't have a lot of driveways and uh, other modifications. Uh, we also did typical sections. I suspect these are going to be difficult to see from the back of the room. Uh, this is the existing condition for King today. Uh, the number of lanes, the, the lane markings. I believe uh, uh, Alan, I'm correct on these. The lanes are currently all 10 foot, except for this one, which is 11. Yeah, 15 and 13 on this side. And 13 on this side. And thir yeah, 13 on the other side. And uh, so a first treatment could be put in the bike lane. You've got the width to do it. And then when there's additional funding to do the actual cycle track, then you can go to the full treatment that you see here, which again is illustrated here. So that uh, we, we uh, gave the challenge to our illustrators to show what it would look like in these scenarios. Another a visual that Alan was able to produce for us, uh, looking at a bus stop, a crossing location, as you see here, and notice it's on both sides. The stop line is set back, uh, what we call an advanced stop line. And again, uh, this is all being done just by transitioning this outer lane here. Am I correct, Alan?